Hi folks, welcome to our next film, The Princess Bride, directed by Rob Reiner. Now, there are so many existential themes in this film, I can't possibly cover them all in this, uh, just a couple of short lectures. And if you do your commentaries on this film, you're gonna have to think about formal features. So the first thing I wanna do is just mention a few of thing, the things you can think about. Um, and since I'm not talking about them, that will just give you more freedom to develop your own analysis. For example, Think about the boy and his grandfather and how they create a kind of framing device for the story. And the interactions between them provides a type of commentary on what's going on in the, in the fictional story and vice versa. Um, also, that creates a kind of voiceover technique where the grandfather is literally reading from a book and then that voiceover provides a sort of motivated device for the um, story within the story. All of those are formal features of the filmmaking. Those are sort of script level decisions that are um, really important formal features that you can um, think about the significance of. Um, the score and the music are, are really interesting and um, create a kind of fairy tale effect. So you can think about that in any of the scenes you analyze. Or just the fact that humor is used as a device or as a kind of storytelling tool throughout the film um, could be philosophically significant. Uh, one last thing that I didn't put on the slide, uh, notice how the shot sequences go. Um, the movement to close-ups is really critical um, and is used to big effect in this film. I'm also gonna focus on a few of the characters. There are so many that I don't even have time to discuss. So Kent Rugen is a wonderful existentialist character. He's, he's like an existentialist devil. He's such a sadist. He creates this machine, which uh, fittingly is called you know, being located in this lair they call the pit of despair. Of course, despair is exactly Kierkegaard's word for existential angst or an existential crisis. And what this machine does is it literally sucks your life away. What could be a more existentially uh, themed uh, torture device? Uh, Kierkegaard couldn't have even dreamed up something um, so symbolic. In this video though, I'm gonna focus on the character of Wesley and talk about his existential situation. What I'm going to try to convince you is that uh, Wesley is a Kierkegaardian knight of faith. Uh, I'm gonna talk about, about a bunch of bits of evidence from the film, but what's fun about film interpretation is you can feel free, free to disagree with me and maybe come up with some reasons why uh, Wesley fails a Kierkegaardian analysis. So remember the way Wesley's character is introduced. He has this love for Buttercup, the farm girl. He's the farm boy. Uh, and he expresses it in this um, elliptical or metaphorical way by uh, repeating this phrase, as you wish, over and over again. Um, then what we see is that this relationship develops between them, and they fall in love with each other. And they have this deep, um, romantic kind of love, exactly the kind of love that Kierkegaard thinks could possibly ex be expressive of the night of faith, if it could actually be possible or realized in the world. The trouble for, for Kierkegaard and his analysis of the lad and the princess is that the love is actually not possible. Um, but if Wesley actually has the belief that this love is not just of eternal significance and life-defining for him, because that's precisely what it is, once he falls in love with Buttercup, Every action in his life is guided and justified. It's given reasons. His whole comportment to reality is given reasons by this relationship. So in the story, of course, it wouldn't be a very good story if there weren't some obstacles to their love. He has to go off and make a fortune or, or make it possible, redeem himself, make enough money so that they can get wed. So there are seeds of conflict here, but his whole reasons for doing that, everything he does in his life, after that relationship starts is precisely justified because of its unconditional meaning that it gives for his life. We see this in the dialogue over and over again. So I'll just give you a few examples. For example, Wesley says uh, before he runs off um, to see the world, I will always come back for you. And she, Buttercup, has a kind of uh, skepticism about it. She's the rational one. She's like, how can you actually be sure? You know, this of course, we all know that contingencies happen in life. Who knows, you could get captured by pirates, which he does. So you, it's, it's not rational. It doesn't fundamentally make sense to have this kind of blind confidence. Uh, but nonetheless, Wesley thinks that his, his relationship of love, because their relationship means so much to him, he thinks that, the, that uh, necessity will rule all. The, their relationship makes it the case that he must come back it expresses his deep commitment, that kind of uh, claim. And so that's what he thinks justifies this type of confidence. 
Uh, that's a precisely Kierkegaardian element. Uh, to be so confident that something in the contingent world could actually be necessary. Uh, that is the kind of absurd confidence that the Knight of Faith precisely would have to have. We see this again when they're reunited. So after Wesley comes back as the man in black um, and Buttercup is now betrothed to Humperdinck and is soon to be the princess, uh, he expresses that exact same attitude that we saw foreshadowed before. He I said I would come back for you. And look, I did come back for you, even though it was seemingly impossible. She again is the sensible one and thinks, well, but I got all these reports that you were dead. Of course, a rational, intelligent person would therefore think it's likely that you're dead. After all, the, the dread pirate Roberts takes no prisoners. But he, as if, as if reason could have no sense here, could matters nothing to him. He says, even death cannot stop true love. So this, this idea that even in this contingent world where things don't always work out the way that we, we want them to, that they must work out that way, that there can be necessity even in the realm of contingency, that is precisely the hallmarks of the Knight of Faith for Kierkegaard. Because it's not just that Wesley's uh, life is given this meaning because they will be reunited in the afterlife. He has this blind confidence that in the temporal material world, their love will be fulfilled. Um, that's what makes him not just a knight of resignation, but an actual knight of faith. Uh, interestingly, also, this relationship is so all-defining for him, it almost gives him, like, romantic superpowers. He's like the romantic hero. He can do these flips, and he can defeat the great swordsman, the Spanish swordsman who has been studying swordplay for 20 years. He can defeat the giant in a test of strength. And then, of course, he can defeat uh, Vizzini in a tense test of intellect. So he has skill, strength, and intellect. He has all the great virtues. And in the story, none of these things really need justified. They all just sort of make sense and we roll with it because we buy this, this premise of the story that the loving relationship between them is so deep and significant, it can seemingly make him a superhero and he can, he can defeat all. Of course, it also allows them to survive the fire swamp. And what's interesting there is not just that this is a testament to their ability to overcome adversity, which is sort of the way it's played uh, at the level of the plot, but it also symbolizes his faith in the temporal in an absurd way. So she again has this, the voice of reason where she says like, how could we ever succeed? Uh, after all, you know, no one has ever survived. The, he says something like, uh, you, you're just saying that because no one has ever done it before. Nobody's ever survived, uh, which is, of course, a great reason to say that we're never going to succeed. But he even has this, uh, his confidence knows no bounds because uh, in his mind, uh, the temporal is already redeemed. Uh, you see, in the Kierkegaardian mindset, it's not the afterlife and, you know, it's not heaven that actually justifies our fulfillment, our religious fulfillment, our right relationship with God. For Kierkegaard, it's in the here and now. So I think this, this line alone might be the most Kierkegaardian. It's that for the night of faith, the right relationship to God is possible here and now if we're able to live our lives in the most authentic way possible. And according to Kierkegaard, that most authentic way is to have a kind of unconditional, life-fulfilling uh, relationship to some other thing. Um, to some object that gives us um, ultimate fulfillment. Now, that, that his commitment is a matter of life or death comes out many, in many ways in the story. So uh, I just, I think this, this moment is also symbolic for Kierkegaard because according to the Knight of Faith, uh, if you have one of these unconditional commitments, your life has a kind of eternal validity, then, then the loss of that validity would literally mean death to you. And so for Wesley, the fact that this relationship he gives no second thought to this being a matter of life or death for him. And that really symbolizes the way in which this is a kind of Kierkegaardian unconditional commitment. For Now, Buttercup's character is really interesting because she doesn't feel the same way. We've already seen many places where she's disagreed with Wesley. Uh, I will talk about her character in another video because um, in, in many ways, her, she has the most complex character in the whole film. But this is really, this contrast, I think, is really symbolic of what Wesley's comportment to reality is, why it's so Kierkegaardian. Because, of course, she 
she demurs. She says she doesn't take the same death first attitude. She actually says, no, just please don't hurt him. I can't possibly stand to lose him again if I could do something to save it. So she's not willing to risk their lives on, on this relationship in the same way. Uh, her reaction, in some ways, she does this because of the relationship, but the motivations and the actions are both different. In fact, they're so different, like neither Humperdinck nor Wesley can understand what she said. They're so taken off guard. They both, you know, they have this humorous moment where they're both like, what was that? I don't understand uh, how you could possibly feel that way. Um, one, one or two more scenes that I'll show you that really signify Wesley's character and his existential plight. Um, when Inigo and Fezzik are having this conversation, this is, this is what happens um, when Wesley's character has gotten the, the, the machine, is gone up to 50 and he's being tortured to death by Humperdinck and Count Rugen. Uh, he's, he has this howl that's like echoing throughout the castle and then throughout the whole countryside. And then these two characters hear it. And, and what Inigo's reaction to say is, is that, that cry must be coming from the man in black. Uh, he knows immediately, he sees the truth of it, which I think is indicative of his character as well. But it's the fact that, it's what he says, that his true love is marrying another tonight, and so therefore he's going through ultimate suffering. It's the idea that only one who has such an existential commitment, the greatest kind of authentic life, for Kierkegaard, they have, in a sense, the most at risk, the most to lose, because there, that ultimate meaning can only come in the temporal world, and that means it's still possible to lose it. It's not just an eternal validity given in the afterlife, which gives the night of resignation a kind of peace and repose and doesn't have the kind of temporal validity that uh, the night of faith has. So this reference to ultimate suffering, I think, talks gives us another insight into the import, the depth of his character's existential commitment to this romantic relationship. Um, and of course, in wonderful Kierkegaardian fashion, uh, you know, it's Kierkegaard's idea that true faith has to be paradoxical and that the impossible should be possible. Well, what's more, what's more symbolic of that than literally coming back to life? In some ways, this is like the Abraham and Isaac story, where Isaac is to be, is to be dead according to God's command, and yet Abraham receives him back per impossible. So that you could be resurrected. Or it's also like the story of John of Silence, the grim fairy tales that Abraham makes reference to, where the dead come back to life miraculously um, on the, on, in order to fulfill um, these relationships and to be uh, completely faithful. So, so what, what does he have living for that even redeems such a miracle? Of course, we all know that the storyline here, it's true, true love is what justifies it. So that's what give, makes his entire life worthwhile. His whole life is worth living because of this relationship with Buttercup. So again, this symbolizes um, the unconditional commitment that he has in a Kierkegaardian sense, and this wonderful um, miracle, which I think is um, equally Kierkegaardian. Um, okay, that pretty much wraps up my analysis of Wesley's character. Let me finally say that he defeats Humperdinck in the final climax for, for his, his character's climactic scene anyway, um, with another uh, a bit of intelligence. So he defeats him just like he defeated Fezzik and Inigo and Vizzini um, by using his wits, even though he literally just came back from the dead and is completely helpless. He can still defeat the prince of the land um, and, and uh, save the day on the basis of his relationship with Buttercup. Um, and so then, uh, of course, it's a happy story. So we get we get the happy Kierkegaardian ending uh, that, that love wins out and this authentic relationship is actually fundamentally fulfilling for them. Okay, thanks.